Nothing like a chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream cone. Nothing like it. Nothing like a bag of Doritos nacho cheese. Nothing like it. Nothing like a Big Mac from McDonald's. Nothing like it. to a special one-on-one -on -one edition of No Dunks. We're back, baby. I'm your host for today, Trey Kirby. Alongside me, it's Tass Mellis. And of course, we've got the man making the magic happen. JD, what's up, y'all? We're joined today yeah. by the producer and co-host of the Raptor Show with Will Liu up in Canada. He's also the co-host of the Running the Break podcast. He's also the author of Cover Story, one of the best basketball books of the past year. And he's also had bylines at Slam, GQ, and the most legendary New York Times, among many, many others. One of the best guys out there, our friend, man of the internet, Alex Wong. Alex, what's up, buddy? Glad to be part of a part of a classic here on No Dunks. Uh, you know, shouts to you, Tass, and the rest of the team. Where's the other guys, man? They want to talk to you? <laughs> Well, you know, you released your book in like October of last year. We said we're going to get Alex on right away. So <laughs> they've been waiting patiently for 11 months, but something came up today, you know? Yeah, they've been here for 11 months <laughs> in the studio, just waiting. Yeah, man. Yeah. Damn, yeah. man, this, this is a story of my life in this industry, man. I got a little respect, but, you know, people, <laughs> people, be, people be hating on me. No, I'm, I'm glad to be here, man. What's up, guys? Uh, we're up? super happy to be talking to you. One of the questions I had for you, though, is when somebody says to you, what do you do? What do you tell them? I mean, you write, you podcast, you're, you're a producer as well. Many hats that you're wearing. Yeah, yeah, many hats that I wear uh, day to day too. I see in the chat, shout out to some <laughs> of the Raptor Show listeners just tuning in just to see what hat I'm wearing. Um, I appreciate you guys, but please get a life. Um, no, just please, <laughs> please continue listening and supporting our show. No, that's actually a really good question. I, I, think, I think, honestly, I just say I cover basketball. Um, I try to keep it really simple. Like I cover the Raptors, I cover the NBA. And, and if people are interested in actually hearing more about what I do, then I'll kind of dive into the different facets. Um, but I like to keep it nice and simple. I, I cover the Raptors. I go to Raptors games, um, you know, and, and get to cover them is what I tell people. Yeah, it's a difficult task. It's a difficult question even for us where ours is pretty streamlined. Just we podcast essentially. Uh -huh. But even then, it gets a little complicated. We're on YouTube. We do the podcast thing. So I'm sure it came up. You're at a wedding this weekend. I was interested to hear about that. How did it come up? Did, was there a small talk question? Hey, you, what do you do? Did that happen? Yeah. And how was the wedding? So, so one of the amazing things now being in Toronto and I think being on Sportsnet now with the Raptor Show uh, with Will Lou, uh, everybody, please subscribe. Uh, as you guys are realizing, I will be promoting the Raptor <laughs> Show 87 times during you the You did good, oh, man. Good. Seamless. Um, but... It, you know, one of the cool things is that there are so many listeners and people who see us now because they stream our YouTube feed on Sportsnet 360. Um, we, we, Will and I, Will was at the wedding as well. Uh, we just run into listeners of the show. And we, uh, you know, we ran into a listener of the show, uh, Brenda, at the wedding, who, who was a friend of the bride and groom. And she was actually listening to a podcast that we did during the off season, these four hour banter pods that we've been doing where I guess I complained about how expensive it is to get, to go to Cineplex, to go to movies here because they don't even let you just buy the popcorn now. Like you have to buy a combo, which is like $27 <laughs> it comes with a drink and Twizzlers. So I went on this whole rant. So then Brenda came up to Will and I and actually handed us a Cineplex uh, gift card. What? <laughs> and, and, and she said, this should cover you for one movie trip. Uh, so, you know, maybe I'll just go watch Nope again or something. So uh -huh. it, it, it is a cool thing. It is a cool thing. I think um, that's one of the things that Will and I really do appreciate, um, given the bigger platform, too, is that we're really able to now connect directly with a lot of people who check out the show. And honestly, that's that's like the coolest part of doing all of this. Has the banter pods become, you know, the instant favorite of everybody who's a fan of the show? Because uh, for us, a lot of times, you know, people love to hear about basketball, our takes on the game and what's going on with the league. But they also love to hear stories about us having to change batteries in our car or going to an Elton John concert. Uh, do people love the four hour banter pods? 
Yeah, except for a couple of people on Reddit, but you know, you can't make everybody <laughs> happy, you know? No, I think, uh, I think one of the things we wanted to do in the off season was just not try to force the ba- basketball content, right? You know, like thanks to uh, Kevin Durant's uh, failed attempt to uh, escape Brooklyn, you know, he gave us a lot of basketball content for about a month. But you know, when you get to August and even September before media day, there's just not a lot of content out there. And I think you can only break down the end of the bench or break down the Rico Hines runs like so many times. <laughs> and, and one of the things that I, I think, especially for Will, because Will is a very uh, basketball focused person. Uh, this is just me saying that I'm a more well-rounded person than him. Um, <laughs> like, like Will is obsessed with the Raptors. And I think, you know, given his platform, people are curious to just know about his life. Cause like he never really talks about anything outside of, you know, how the Raptors should fold their franchise. Cause they've lost to the Pistons, you know, three straight times. And, um, you know, I think it's a good platform for people to just get to know us. Um, and, and it's one of those things where it's the off season, you know, we're not on air, it's podcast only people can consume it, um, how they want. And we don't intend for it to be four hours. It's just one of those things when Will and I start chatting, um, it just kind of goes in that territory. And I get it. I gotta give you guys credit too, you know, like going back to, you know, basketball Jones and like no dunks and all the different variations that you guys have gone through. And even now, you know, the way you guys have expanded into talking about like F1 and baseball, I think it's super cool at the end of the day, when it comes to content. Uh, creation, especially in the basketball space, uh, you know, I think it's very personality driven. And Taz, like, you probably don't remember this, but I remember, I remember our first show on air on Fan 590 for Raptor Show, start of last season. I remember, I think you sent me a DM or, you know, you hit me up on Twitter. You were like, yeah, keep the personality um, kind of going, like, after our first segment on radio. And, you know, little things like that, um, you know, really does resonate with me because, you know, you, you just hope you put stuff out there and the audience will connect with you. And, you know, enough of the audience is connected with us. And, and you know, we take that as a responsibility. Man, I love talking serious <laughs> content talk, man. This is my favorite. Yeah, I think you got into the serious content talk on your latest banter pod in about hour three. Where you guys started talking about stick around for the business gems. <laughs> yeah, what we want to do uh, this coming season, and that that got serious. I mean, it's it's something that sometimes we get into off air, and when it was on air, it just sounds like I don't know. It just sounds. You're saying we should drop a planning pod so yeah. people can hear no, what no, we got going it on. No, terrible. Next... It sounds terrible. It sounds terrible. It just sounds like. Yeah, no, so I'll yeah tell we you want to do this. this. We want more interviews. Yeah, of course. Of course you want to do that. Uh, no, I'll tell you guys this. is, is a funny thing because, like, last year when we started at Sportsnet, you know, our boss, Dan Toman, you know, is, is the person that I kind of run a lot of the content plans through. And, you know, being a producer on the show, like, you know, I kind of just plan out the vibe of the show, the guests on the show, the topics, kind of the flow. And one of the things I pitched him was an idea, like, every Wednesday, Will and I should do a video segment called um, Office Hours, where where we just sit in a conference room at Sportsnet and basically do what you were saying to us. Like we just talk about the show mm-hmm. and I'm like, Oh, people are going to love this. And it was just radio silence when I pitched the idea. <laughs> so, so, so I was like, you know what, let me just wait for the off season when nobody's listening at Sportsnet and we're just going to do these four hour pods, which was basically the vision in the first place. Yeah, no, they just don't want to put in the work to put up the cameras and deal with all that stuff. I think, I think <laughs> it's the work behind it because that comes up about every three years, every company we've worked for oh yeah fly on the wall gotta do it fly on the wall yeah everybody's gonna love it and then nobody wants to do the work it's just too much work uh, it's, it's like yeah. you, you guys talk for four hours you're the ones talking you're the ones getting your own food uh, calling for uh, your uber eats at 1 a.m and stuff like that uh, uh, as i heard on the last pod nobody wants to do the work um and uh, listen, I feel like a friend of yours because I listen to a four hour podcast. Like you're just complaining <laughs> about the, the Cineplex $27 combo. Like I want to say like Will does on the show. Like you come from generational wealth, Alex. Wong. You, you, you can afford $27, which is a ridiculous price. You can't just buy popcorn. I mean, it's been a minute since I've been to a movie theater. I did see uh, Minions, The Rise of Gru uh, in the cinema. Mm. Gotta see it on a big screen, you know, as the director says. Kevin uh, Lamignon? Yeah. But it's a it's an expensive night out at the movies these days. <laughs> no uh, doubt. <laughs> oh, we're old. Shout out to Just Brenda. Just a bunch of old guys here complaining about how expensive movies are and how long podcasts are. <laughs> It ain't just uh, the Raptor show for you, though, uh, Stephen. Stephen. Stephen LeBron. People want us to ask you what that name comes from, of course. But it's not just that. You're also doing the Running the Break podcast. Who's the better co-host, though, Will or CJ? 
Oh man, you know, I think we just have different dynamics, man. You're gonna get me into my politician <laughs> mode right now. You know, I think I think when it comes to bantering with Will, like Will and I obviously have a friendship going back. So so I think, you know, when we banter, it's definitely I feel like more natural and we we like know each other's lives very well. So we're able to really kind of poke fun at each other for, for our kind of idiosyncrasies. Wow, that's one of the biggest words I've ever used. Um <laughs> and and um, you know, with CJ, I think, you know, with running running the break, everybody should go and subscribe to that as well uh got an interview with ronnie 2k uh this week that's going to be dropping tomorrow um you know the focus is very much about off the court you know we talk about fashion talk about sneakers we had trey on um you know earlier in the summer to to chat about um you know favorite uh you know nba references and in rap lyrics and things like that um so for for me and cj like we just get to geek out about all the things that we love about basketball away from the floor where with will um, you know, I think we're able to kind of stay focused on, on the Raptor space. So I think with both of them, that's why I like doing both of the shows because they're very different and there's not really a lot of crossover there. And I definitely enjoy the time that I spend with uh, both of them while well, I am a politician. That, that was a great <laughs> answer, man. What a diplomat. Anytime you get somebody that has multiple co-hosts, though, on a podcast, you got to figure out a way to try and make them choose between that's them and tough. split them up. <laughs> yeah, I think I tried to do that to you. Yeah, too. of course. Like, you gotta try. And I was like, who? I was like, who's the legend, worst man. dressed person on No Dunks? And wow. you were like, you know, they all suck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So you gotta play it. You gotta play it smooth. You gotta either take a swipe at everybody or take a swipe at nobody. Uh, I like the way you played it. But let's talk a little bit of basketball. NBA off season, I guess, is finally over it feels like it's officially over with the yeah. start of media day uh, yesterday for a whole bunch of teams. Uh, Alex, if you had to rate the off season, what would you rate it? Maybe out of ten, maybe a, a thumbs rating, stars, whatever you want to get it. In terms of like for the overall NBA, yeah, the enjoyment of it. Uh, the enjoyment of it, I would say a two. Oof. Um, I, I feel like Yikes. all the news items that have come out, you know, when you think about the Ime Udoka situation in Boston, Robert Sarver in Phoenix. Um, and even when you think about things that happen on the court, like, you know, when, when you think about free agency, usually there's a lot of excitement, right? But, you know, I felt like the Donovan Mitchell trade rumors kind of just dragged on and then suddenly he was in Cleveland. Um, you know, the Rudy Gobert sweepstakes, um, you know, I guess we got a Brian Windhorse meme out of it. So I'm going to bump it up to a <laughs> three out of ten. And Kevin Durant, you know, I've been posing the question. Don't don't clip this and tag KD because, you, know, I, I, you know, I'm trying to live a simple life. But, like, did KD have the worst summer of any superstar in NBA history? Because this man tried to force himself out of, of Brooklyn, and Joe Sy said, no, like, I'm not talking to no millionaires. Like, the first billionaire is the <laughs> hardest. Like, don't talk to me. You're showing up to work. Kyrie is showing up to work. And now somehow we, we, we're in a league where Jay Crowder, boss man 99, has more leverage than Kevin Durant. Uh, like, so I'm giving it a 2 out of 10. Wow, uh, yes. Honestly, fair. I would have had it higher, but uh, you're right. I mean, we had a lot of waiting periods. I'm giving it high grades for – we did have some trades, you know. Rudy got traded. DeJounte Murray got traded. Out of it. Obviously, Donovan Mitchell got traded. That's three all-stars. That's good. Yeah. But there was a whole bunch of waiting. We had the Kevin Durant trade request on basically day one of free agency, right, which kind of put tough. a stop to things for a while. So we had that big break. Finally, nothing happened. And then, like you're saying, it's been mostly bad news during uh, the month of September. But I wanted to circle back to a couple of things. Alex, which are you more surprised uh, by that Kyrie and KD still there in Brooklyn or that Russell Westbrook is still on the Lakers? Because these were both things that seemed like a done deal. None of these players would be with their teams. And apparently, we're just running it back. Yeah, I would go with Russell Westbrook in L.A. And listen, I think we've all gotten a Russell Westbrook jokes off you know in terms of the three-pointers clanking off the rim um you know every game and all that stuff but like man some of the questions i saw from media day yesterday you know i saw one reporter ask him like how does it feel like to just be at a workplace where you're not wanted basically mm -hmm. and i'm like damn like you know i understand you know journalists gotta come with the hard hit hitting oh, questions uh, and that not was just fire lob, yeah but not just lob <laughs> softballs like me but like at, at some point it feels personal like oh, i absolutely. you know like at, at some point like can we just respect russell westbrook a little bit like he's not the first player that we've seen have trouble transitioning to the later phase of his career um and one of the things that you know i I'll always say when it comes to westbrook is like just put yourself in his position like he has been the man in like high school he's been the man in college you know he's he was the man 
um, in the NBA. You know, he won that MVP, that crazy one man run, you know, triple doubles every night. If you're, if you're performing at that level and you've been talked about at that level and suddenly, you know, people expect you to just accept some kind of bench role and change your whole game, it can't be easy. Now, do I, you know, uh, disagree with that, that Russ should, should change and adapt? No, definitely. I think he should. But I think a part of us should just kind of understand how difficult it must be for someone in his position. It's not like he's coming into this season thinking he's going to average 23% from three. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and you know what I mean? Like, that, that, everybody expects that from him. But, like, in Russ's mind, he's like, I'm going to come out and be an all-NBA, all-star player and, I guess, become best friends with Patrick Beverly. Are you buying that uh, that media day quote, Beverly saying that Westbrook is his best friend on the Lakers so far? <laughs> well, I think Beverly understands that uh, he probably has a longer run with the Lakers than than Westbrook. Um, like like NBA wise, like I still feel like if the Lakers can find the right deal, they're they're going to make a move, right? Like they keep dangling those 27, 2027 and twenty twenty nine draft picks, mm-hmm. um, and so I think eventually they they will find a deal for Russ. And I think what's going to happen is, you know, Darvin Ham has been really supportive of Russ publicly saying all the right things, but let's see what happens when Darvin Ham says, Hey Russ, we want you to come off the bench. Um, so, so let's, let, let's see what happens. I mean, Russ, Russ's agent quit himself yeah. this summer, right? Yeah. Like, so, so there's a lot going on. I personally just hope Russ gets to a situation where, where he's just happier. Like even if it's on a team that's not in the spotlight and, and not contending, um, like, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, you're an NBA player. Like, he doesn't need all this ridicule. And he's working on the three-point shot. We've talked about it a billion times. The, the, the clips the clips come in fast and furious of Russell Westbrook in year, what, 14 or 15 here. Stepping into three-point shots like he's relearning the shot. I just don't get how, why every shot that he's taking in these clips that are going around, that he's stepping into it. Like, that's not going to happen. You're not going to get, I guess, a little bit, but... You're just gonna get shut passes, and so, but it's yeah. like a three-step runway. Like, <laughs> let's practice what we do in games here. Now I sound like Will Lou, um, uh, but, but like, but that uh, that comment yesterday, the question, I don't know where that uh, who that reporter was, but it felt like that was made for social media. That reporter was ready because it was such a quick question. It was, hey, the Lakers say they want, or no, sorry, sorry, you say you want to play for the Lakers and you really want to be here, but how does it feel that? the team doesn't want you to be here like whoa you're bringing that out on media day man uh that was I, i've come i've come around too on russ yeah relearn your thing you're like relearn yeah fine 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 but now now i just i just want to be a russ stand i just want to say you just <laughs> just want to be a russ stand uh, yeah again. like you know you made it this far you you, you you're, you've done good for us you've given us 15 stinking years of hard basketball i don't i don't want to ridicule the guy anymore but he should just stand there in practice and take and practice the threes that he'll be taking this coming season off passes he's like running he's like kyle lowry shots that's not gonna happen anyway. i guess he's just planning on being wide open uh when the time comes <laughs> to it uh alex the other thing i was curious about you mentioned jay crowder ha- seems to have a little bit more juice than kevin durant with regards to the trade request you think Jay Crowder is the kind of player who should be making a trade request and putting out a hype video to get people excited about his return to the NBA? Oh hell yeah, man! I want him, I want him, I want him salsa dancing at that, oh yeah, like all twenty nine or whatever, however many arenas there are. And, you know, this this one, I I still can't believe that happened, man. Um, Frozen. He waited for a good time to uh, make his trade <laughs> request when it's uh, things are slowing down here in September. Just, you can get away with a, an all-caps trade request when there's not much else going on. The fifth starter on the Phoenix Suns becomes the biggest story of the year. So. I, I did forget that he salsa it all over NBA floors. Uh-huh. Oh, am, am I back? Yeah, I He's think back, uh, you're back. You're back, boss man. And I like how you, <laughs> how, how you reminded everybody, is his Twitter handle bossman99? I think yeah, so. I think it, I think it's like his Twitter or IG handle. And he only yeah, like like Trey just mentioned, like he only types in all caps. Like it's like the most <laughs> Jay Crowder thing. Actually, my favorite Jay Crowder story was when he was in when he got traded to Cleveland. I mean, he he obviously has a history with LeBron going back to like Boston versus Cleveland. And I was doing a story about all the really fun individual handshakes that um that lebron does with all his teammates so i was going around the locker room talking to everyone like iman shumpert gave me this like great uh like five minute monologue about just the history of handshakes like dating back 
um, like tying it to like black history and like what it means um, for like, you know, uh, a group of black men to like have this camaraderie. And then I go to uh, Jay Crowder and Isaiah Thomas and they're both like, nah, man, we don't want to talk about this, man. The handshakes or whatever. And uh, I was like, damn, these two hate it here. They're definitely going to get traded. <laughs> and they were both traded. Yeah. <laughs> the bad vibes were imminent uh, and palpable when you were talking mm. to him about uh, handshakes. And speaking of bad vibes, I mean, there's a little bad vibes going around at Media Day uh, in some places yesterday. I mean, the Suns and the Celtics certainly stick out. You notice anything from these various media days, Alex, uh, that interested you, that, uh, that something you want to talk about? Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like this has been talked to death, but I mean, the Brooklyn Nets, the Brooklyn Nets are hilarious. <laughs> uh, I think it was, I think it was Nick Ferdell who said, it feels like a family, um, you know, who, who, who was going to go through with a divorce and then decided last minute to not go through with it. <laughs> and now they're trying to rebuild the pieces. And I'm like, wow, yeah, that is the exact vibe. Uh, I mean, did Kevin Durant not actively try to get his head coach and general manager fired? Like this yeah. was oh, this yeah. was reported, right? And Steve Nash talked about it yesterday, and he was like, "Oh, this stuff happens in the family." I'm like, "What are you, what are you talking about, man? I've never I've never tried to actively fire my dad or my mom. Like I've never tried to actively get them out of my life. Try like, to get our dad you know? to leave the house, talk <laughs> yeah, him back exactly. into staying. Once again, uh, KD came up with a list of demands, and Joe Sai just ripped it up. He's like, "Yo, talk to me when you when you make your first billion." Um, so I respect Joe Sai a lot, but like. I think the Brooklyn situation is so interesting to me. It, it's so dramatic there that uh, the Ben Simmons coming back from playing basketball after an entire year off it is like number three on that list. Barely a story. Uh, yeah, when it should be like the focal point because I feel like, especially when you talk about them on the court, how Ben Simmons does, does this year is going to really determine how good the Nets can be. Um, you know, for me, big believer in vibes. Like, um, you know, Phoenix Suns technically outside of Jay Crowder really returning most of their roster from last season. And, you know, that core group has done a lot of great things the last two years. But based on everything, like, I'm not, you know, I'm telling you right now, Suns are not going to finish top four in the West, man. That's my hot take. And, and same with Brooklyn. Like, I don't, I'm going to go ahead and just say, I don't see KD, Kyrie, and Ben Simmons, all three of them being on the Brooklyn Nets by the end of the season. Like, I just, I just can't see how they can just pick up the pieces back together. Maybe they go on a r ridiculous run on the court and, you know, success on the court always solves everything. But, like, it's just a mess over there. And, like, I, I need Steve Nash to just, like, quit, man. Steve Nash does not need this. Like, has Steve Nash been happy <laughs> one day in his life, like, coaching with the Brooklyn Nets, except for that one time when KD, you know, scored 50 uh, against the Bucks in the playoffs and they had that big hug at the end? Like, I've sure. never seen Steve Nash this miserable, and he's a happy-go-lucky guy. So, so Steve Nash, please just you know get away from there. <laughs> yeah, we're always saying he could just be watching Tottenham, having a great time watching the Spurs, and be fine with it. Uh, you mentioned you're a big fan of vibes. How were vibes at Raptors Media Day? Things uh, looking good for Toronto? Yeah, the vibes are always good. I think when you've got guys like Scotty around, and you know Pascal had a great bounce back season last year, so the joy is back. And, you know, Fred's the Fred's the diplomatic, you know, veteran now, which is kind of weird because I do remember him just coming up as the bench mom, feels like yesterday. Um, you know, drama-free, I think, would be the way to say it. You know, I was thinking back to past media days. Everybody remembers the Kawhi media laugh, media day laugh, you know, and even last year when the Raptors were coming back from Tampa, just having them back in the city was a big deal. Not a lot of things to talk about yesterday, right? Like, the, like you know, they brought the whole team back. Um, you know, they're going to continue developing, you know, they feel very good about their team internally, all the stuff that they say on media day. The only biggest drama was really OG Ananobi was involved in some trade rumors and he addressed those really quickly and said that he's happy to be here. Uh, and OG apparently on the, on the media directory now goes by O dot G dot. Like that was really the biggest thing that came out. Of it. He added <laughs> James Herbert, shout out to James Herbert. He's like some, some people in the off season add, uh, add muscle. Uh, OG is the only one who added a punctuation. So, uh, respect <laughs> for that, so. Yeah. that's not bad. I guess, uh, minor changes for the Raptors this year, Wancho, Otto Porter, and a couple of periods in OG Ananobi's name. The Bulls basically did the same. They didn't add any punctuation, but they added uh, like the seventh and eighth men from the old Brooklyn Nets squad last year. Meanwhile, a couple of teams who both the Bulls and Raptors are chasing in the Hawks and the Cavs made huge trades for All-Stars. Alex, I know you've been watching 5 through 12 in the Eastern Conference. 
intently the past couple of years. It's been the most competitive part of the NBA, if you ask me, trying to figure out who's going to be 5-6 and then in the play-in games. Rank these teams for me. We got the Raptors, the Bulls, the Cavs, and the Hawks all kind of in the same zone, but obviously the Cavs and Hawks made changes this year. Bulls and Raptors were content to basically run it back. You know, let's, let's preface this with the fact that I'm producer and co-host of the Raptor show. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, definitely going to, you know, realistically though, I would, you know, objectively put the Raptors uh, at the top of this list. You know, I truly think, you know, they play, they played like a 500 team last year for the first 50 games. And there was a lot of different factors contributing to that. And the main one being that Pascal was out at the beginning of the season. And, you know, you see the way that they were able to make a push in the final couple months of the season, basically playing as a 50 plus win team. And, you know, I, I thought they had a really good showing uh, against the Sixers in the first round, even though they did fall down 3-0. And you bring back Pascal, you know, a fully healthy summer to, to, to work. You know, there's a lot of continuity. You mentioned, like, I think even guys like Chris Boucher and Precious Achua are going to take another step. And then, of course, all eyes is going to be on Scotty. Um, you know, I, I think the Raptors fan base is really excited. And sometimes I do try to tamper those expectations because, like, young players sometimes take a lot of time. You know, you look at, you know, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown in Boston, like how many ups and downs they had to go through uh, before they broke through to the finals. But I, I, I truly do believe, um, you know, this Raptors team is built to have a really good, regular season um and and i really would be surprised if they did didn't finish in the top four Hmm. um so i would put the raptors up top um man the rest is really tough um i guess i would go with the Cavs next you know i think they have a really promising core um you know obviously evan mobley um you know jared allen darius garland you add donovan mitchell to the mix i think this is a perfect situation for donovan mitchell you know, he doesn't have to be the guy. He's got great support on defense. And, you know, I, so I'm going to put the Cavs next. Um, man, Trey, you're going to kick me off, man. So I'm going to put the Hawks. <laughs> I'm going to put the Hawks next and then have the Bulls fourth. That's what I'm going to do. Unfortunately, I think you're probably right with the way things are going to go. Yeah. I, I had to ask it, man. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, the Bulls are kind of flying under the radar for having a disappointing offseason, but the Lonzo injury and then. The fact that it didn't heal and he had to have surgery right before training camp was starting. It ain't good. The vibes aren't good. The vibes aren't bad yet, but the vibes are certainly not good. It, meanwhile, the Hawks, like, it looks like they already love each other yeah. as a team. The Cavs are super talented. And the Raptors, like, their over-under numbers are going to be low because they are kind of similar to me, to the Miami Heat, where you can't really guess what they're going to be like in the regular season because they're going to overachieve. And I'm sure the Raptors yes, they will are. overachieve just like the Heat always right. do. Dude, they have hit over on their over-under total 10 of the last 11 seasons. Because I'm not surprised. Yeah, that's what people underestimate this team and underestimate the vibes. You mentioned the vibes. I'm surprised you gave it a 2 out of 10 in terms of the offseason, Alex, because... I don't care if Scotty Barnes is playing against guys I've never seen before in those Rico Hines runs. The guy looked like Kawhi Leonard 2.0 with those thick tree trunk legs, like just dominating in that fashion, like just bullying guys who have never been NBA players before. I don't care. Uh, I think uh, he just, it's, it's just, I don't know. It's nice to dream here. It's September. It's fun to just think about Scotty Barnes and, and what he can ascend. And just Masai Ujiri talked about media day. Like, that dude is still pushing this team forward. He, he, he knows he doesn't have a, su- a superstar there, but he still says, yeah, 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 we can talk about getting better and being good, but at the end of the day, it's about winning. So he's still pushing this team and pushing all his guys. So I'm excited to see what this team can do. You mentioned Siakam and, and even a, a healthy Fred for most of the season with a Scotty. With an OG and an Obi who Masai talked up yesterday as potentially taking another leap. He's done a good job of uh I think just putting a lot of confidence in his guys. There's there's that I don't know how any Eastern Conference team looks at the schedule and says, We're gonna be a fifty win team because you just mentioned four yeah. teams that are like six through nine. There's too many good teams. There's so many good teams. Somebody's gonna be ridiculously disappointed. And it could be the Bulls, I guess. Uh but there's gonna there's gonna be there's gonna be some team that finishes like out of the freaking playoffs, like 38 and 44. Oh, whatever. definitely. Uh, like, uh, Charlotte's got to be worried. The Knicks, I think, got to be a little bit worried. And RJ Barrett said they're going to shock the world. It would be a shock to me if the Knicks <laughs> are a very good team next year. So I agree with him on that. How about uh, any of these other teams, uh, Alex? Who are you excited to watch in this coming season? We've had minor changes over the course of the season or offseason. 
Yeah, you know, I'm really excited to watch the Cavs. You know, I really think they're a really exciting young team. And if we're looking, if we're looking out west too, I'm excited to watch the Clippers. You know, uh, on the games that Kawhi will show up. You know, funniest man on earth. You know, I'm really excited to see what the Clippers can do, and even Denver getting Jamal Murray back. So um, New Orleans is another team that I think is really exciting. Minnesota as well, adding Rudy Gobert. Um, you know, I, I'm just not listing the Eastern Conference teams because I feel like because I cover the Raptors, I watch so many of them. Like, I'm so <laughs> tired of watching the Celtics, the Sixers. I'm so, yo, I don't want to see another Raptors Magic game in my lifetime. <laughs> I don't even want to see another Raptors Heat game in my lifetime. Why is it always 76 to 70? <laughs> and the Raptors yep. make eight threes and they take 50 of them. Like, I'm so tired of those games. <laughs> I don't blame you. I was laughing. Uh, it was going around on Twitter. It was like wingspans by position or something like that. <laughs> and it was like the Raptors was like their their point guard and their center were like number 30th or were 30th in, in wingspan, but then the longest wingspans, two through four. And the Heat were the complete opposite. I was like, it's no wonder these teams bash each other so the way they do. Uh, but Alex, uh, what else should we talk about here? You wrote a book. It's called Cover Story, the NBA and the modern basketball as told through its most iconic magazine covers. I love this book, especially my blurb on the back. <laughs> That's why we didn't kick you off the podcast when you said the Bulls were going to finish ninth or 10th. Why in the world would you pick me to blurb your book? And it, did it make the cut just because nobody else emailed back? No, it, no, it definitely make the cut. No, Trey, I think. You know, when it when it comes to, you know, this book is, is obviously very much rooted in basketball and its cultural impact, um, you know, through looking at famous magazine covers in Sports Illustrated, Slam, you know, ESPN, the magazine, even the source, source sports, and then all these different magazines that I grew up reading. And, you know, when I, when I think about basketball and culture, you know, I wanted to think of people who would appreciate this book. And you were one of the first people that I thought of. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was very important to me. It was an honor. It was an honor for you to, to, to check out, to, to be able to check out this book and, and provide uh, a blurb for it. Well, it was an honor for me too. And it made me a hero in my own household for my kids to see my name on the back of somebody else's book. They were so excited, but Alex, what's been the coolest thing that's happened for you since this book came out Has somebody come to you and said, man, I read the book and it was crazy to be thrown back to those times. Yeah, you know, actually, one of the nicest things that, you know, I received a message from Dennis Page, who was the founder of Slam, uh, because Slam really opened the doors to me in terms of um, giving me access. You know, I was able to talk to Dennis um, about the founding of Slam back in 93. I was able to talk to, you know, iconic writers growing up that I grew up reading, you know, from Scoop Jackson to Russ Bankson, and talking to the current Slam crew as well, you know, Susan Thomas and then Adam Figman. Um, wow, it's not, I'm like I'm like the game right now, man. I'm just name dropping on it. <laughs> um, so, but you know, Dennis sent me a really nice message and said that thank you for capturing the spirit of Slam, basically. And you know that that that's important to me. I think I think when you're writing a book and you're telling the stories of other people, again, you know, there there is a there is kind of a bit of responsibility to that. You, you want to be fair in your storytelling, but you also want to get the story right. And, you know, for him to, to, to kind of send me that note, you know, that, that did mean a lot to me. Best name drop. I think you've ever done. Wasn't just now it was on the banter pod. You said that you almost appeared on Jesus and Mero, that you were there, <laughs> you were there in the green room waiting to come on. So when Jesus and Mero split up, I thought, well, maybe, maybe Jesus is going to start a show yeah, with okay, Alex Wong. Okay. Can I tell, can I tell that story for like yeah. one minute? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah. So I was living in New York at the time and you know, I knew Jesus. I reached out to Jesus cause back, back in the day I, I did my own uh, podcast, just Stephen LeBron radio is a very independent thing. And I reached out to Jesus. I think when he had like 2000 followers on Twitter, um, cause I just saw a tweet of his and I thought he was hilarious and he was coming up in complex and I actually asked him to come record a podcast with me at my New York apartment. And, you know, uh, rookie me, you know, I don't got JD behind the boards, all of that stuff. I forgot to press record. I was so excited <laughs> that, that we, we chatted for two hours. He was so kind. Um, and, and then I was like, oh man, now I got to hit him up and be like, Hey man, like this just didn't record. And I wasn't even going to ask him to record again. Um, cause I just felt so bad. He's like, yo, I'm coming through again tomorrow. So like, we just actually did the whole Amazing. podcast again a second time. Um, you know, I bought them, I forgot some IPA beer. I should have kept that and sold it. Like, you know, drank by Jesus. <laughs> um, and then, you know, kept, kept in touch with them as he was blown up. And then when I was leaving New York, I was just hitting up a lot of people saying goodbye and, you know, hit up Jesus. And he's like, yo, come through the vice studios. 
um, and come chill and just like kind of sit in the audience, get to know the crew, we can hang out after. When I went there, the guests, uh, I guess that was supposed to be on, uh, was not available or they couldn't reach them last minute. So then uh, Jesus, uh like went to Miro and went to the producers behind the scenes and was like, hey man, my boy Alex, you know, he's written for GQ, he's written for Slam, he's got jokes. So then like for like three minutes, I was sitting there thinking of what I would put on my rainbow <laughs> yeah. um, on the show. Yeah. And then of course the guests ended up uh, appearing, but I did, and I, I do have a photo uh, with Jesus and Miro like on the set as if I was just on the show, <laughs> like in front of the bear and the Tim. So I remember posting that out and I've never felt so uh, more popular in my life. Yeah, just Photoshop a uh, rainbow on it and it'll be like you appeared on the show anyways. <laughs> what did you settled on? What were you gonna say for your identification? <laughs> oh yeah, so I was telling Will, it was probably would have been something uh lame not lame i mean i'm proud of it It would have been like something asian it would have been like oh it's an honor to be asian or something you know it, it would have it would have been something like that it's hard to come up with something like yeah. winning on the spot i feel like it's a lot of pressure definitely yeah. you need at least three minutes to think of it ahead of time <laughs> <laughs> so that's cover story uh do you have a favorite do you have a favorite cover from you know slam sports illustrated or some of these other magazines back in the day yeah, you know, my favorite cover, and it only got a brief mention in the book, but it's, it's the Clippers one. It's the Clippers one with Elton Brand, um, Lamar Odom, and I want to say Q Rich, and they're wearing each other's Darius jerseys. Darius Miles, right? Yeah, Darius Miles. Darius Miles is there. Yeah, like they're wearing each other's jerseys, and they've got do-rags on. Um, that, was just a, that was just a really cool era of, of the Clippers. Like, I think we all remember growing up, and a lot of listeners remember growing up, like it was Lakers, 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 right? Like from Magic to like Shaq and Kobe, the Clippers was like, like, who are you talking about? Like Loy Vaught, um, you know, Pooh <laughs> Richardson, Piyakowski. Eric Piakowski, <laughs> my man. Like, like they were not a, a fun team. I think the only time they like, people ever talked about them was one year they started like 0-17. And, and I remember turning on <laughs> Jay Leno and Jay Leno started making Clippers jokes every night. And I was like, oh my God, this is, yeah, there's the cover right there. Um, and it's, um, yeah, that, that, that is actually my favorite cover. I, I just great. think like aesthetically, it really captures an entire era and it really captures how I tried to dress in a uh, grade 10. So it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I started wearing headbands as soon as that <laughs> one came out. It must be awesome for you then having written this book to go on to start working and editing the first issue issue of Slam Canada. Tell, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Oh damn, man, my resume is deep. You got uh, that yeah, seriously, man. So, <laughs> yo, that that was another that was another wonderful opportunity. Um, you know, Adam Figman, who runs Slam in the U.S., reached out to me and kind of gave me a heads up um, that he he kind of vouched for me in terms of you know uh, putting in a good word with the Canada team of of being part of the editing, uh, being an editor on that first issue. And it was, it was super cool to work with the entire team from Slam Canada um, to bring in really like, um, I was able to hand pick all the writers, um, writers that I wanted to write these features. And you know, the theme of the first issue was um, just to celebrate the history of basketball in Canada. So not just the Raptors, but also women's basketball and also just the history of the sport here in the country. Um, so, so many great talented people were able to celebrate a lot of writers, a lot of photographers, um, and, you know, had Kia Nurse on the cover, you know, Shay was on another cover and uh, Steve Nash as well. Um, so, you know, it, it, that was really fun. That was, that, that was really fun. And I hope Slam Canada uh, gets to continue to grow because so many of us, um, whether we lived in Canada or overseas, anywhere outside of the U.S., even in Asia, in Europe, like Slam was such a gateway for, for us to learn about basketball. And I hope it can continue to be that way for, for the next generation. Moving further down your uh, CV here, I see you're currently mm -hmm. working on Prehistoric, a book about the arrival of the Raptors in Toronto and the team's first season, which is supposed to come out next year. Is that still the plan? Yeah, so I'm actually, you know, people watching this stream might think I'm a real chill dude. I'm actually stressed out right now because my <laughs> manuscript is due in four months. Um, so hopefully we can wrap up this podcast soon so I can go back to work, guys. <laughs> no, uh, for four hours, actually. So. <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, Every we're only 45 in right now. Yo, anytime for you guys, man, honestly. But, like, um, 
Yeah, prehistoric is going to be, uh, you know, an inside look at how the Raptors came to Canada and uh, about the first season. Uh, you know, um, I guess I can say this publicly. Uh, Damon Stoudemire is going to provide the forward. Cool. Um, nice. And, you know, if I had a chance to do about 130 plus interviews, uh, you know, with, with uh, most of the roster. Um, so, you know, wow. you talk about Vincenzo Esposito, I've talked to him, John Tabak, I've talked to him, AC Earl, Oliver Miller, Tracy Murray, Holy. Talk, to, talk to Brendan Malone, um, you know, ownership group, organization. It's going to dive into not just on the court, but looking at how they built out the broadcast, um, you know, the origin story of the logo, which I did a, a story on for Slam a few years ago, which I'm going to expand on. Inside look at when they beat the Bulls. Um, an inside look really of telling the backstories of all these people who made the Toronto Raptors possible. Um, so prehistoric, yeah, coming next year, coolest interview in the book I've done so far was actually with Samuel L. Jackson. What? Because he was a Raptors fan Damn in right. the first year. Yep. And one of the most famous things that he did was in the Quentin Tarantino movie, Jackie Brown, famously in a scene, he held up a Raptors duffel bag. He said, I got it right here in my Raptors duffel bag. Um, he was probably carrying drugs or something, you know, just stereotyping <laughs> the whole movie. Um, but like, I had a chance to just talk to him about what it was like to, uh, you know, uh, you know, be watch an expansion team in Toronto at the Sky Dome during that first year, and also just got the backstory of how he ended up getting that uh, duffel bag on set. So it's a lot of those stories, a lot of those stories um, that people might not think of because. Um, I'm sure Taz can uh, attest to this too. When people think about the first year of the Raptors, they remember like three things. Mm -hmm. Like they remember like, you know, Isaiah Thomas crashing through the uh, Raptors logo mm -hmm. during his intro press conference. They remember maybe uh, Damon Sotomayor getting booed on draft night. And they remember when they beat Jordan and the Bulls because they won 72 games that season. And that's really all people remember. And for me, it's like, I've been a Raptors fan my whole life. You know, I was like nine years old when the Raptors came here. I remember watching them on the new VR, but I didn't really follow them that intimately. And like, I want to tell this story because I think there's a younger generation of fans who think the Raptors started when like Vince Carter, you know, stuck his arm, you know, stuck his whole elbow in the rim at the 2000 dunk contest. And, and it's like, it's important for people to understand um, and learn and appreciate about the origin story of the Raptors. So that's, that's really why I, uh, you know, thanks for taking this book pitch meeting. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm looking forward to it because I know people have tried to do the first few years and, and there's been plenty of decent books written about it. But to hear the interview, the scope of the interviews you've done, I, I know you've been dropping names this whole podcast, but man, uh, it continues there. You're going to hurt your back picking up all those names you just dropped. But that's that's a, that's a lot of names. We talk about, yeah, that first season in here because I think <clears> – <throat> It's the last game that you've been to, JD, was the that Jordan game. <laughs> I know you were there. Um, you you just happened to be there when Jordan beat I'm the I'm sorry, did you say or the last game? Yeah, that I, was the a joke. last Raptors game I've been to. <laughs> that uh, was a joke. That was that was the obviously the first game you were you That was the my that was my first Raptors game, yeah. Yeah, that was actually. first season. Yeah. Uh, yep. So there's a lot. There's a lot to go through in that first season. There, there was a lot. I mean, Samuel L. Jackson as a a Raptors super fan back then. He was literally a Raptors super fan for several years. People don't know that. Uh, th that's a that's a, a good interview. That's a good. There's there's a lot to go through uh, and a lot of a lot of heartache and heartbreak um, and some bad bad moments in the Sky Dome. Sounds like a must read for Raptors fans, no though. As a Raptor fan uh, for your whole life, Alex, what's the best era of Raptors jerseys? Best era of Raptors jerseys? It's uh, it's when Vince was here. It's when they moved away from the Dino, which I love. But it was those Nike um, Nike Dazzle jerseys that had like the purple, and it just said Toronto. And I think there was like a black like block pattern on the side. Sure. Basically, the jersey that he wore during the dunk contest. Um, that's that's really the era of jerseys that the Raptors have not retroed. Like they've retroed the Dino, you know, they've retroed the Huskies, you know, now they've done these um, kind of remixes with, with the Drake black and gold, uh, with the OVO collapse, but they haven't gone back to just the straight up like 2000, 2001 Raptors um, because that was the height of the fandom, right? Like when Vince hit those like nine threes, uh, I think in the first half against the Sixers, in that series when he battled AI, like those are great memories. So for, for me, uh, the, the jersey from from that era, for sure. And uh, are you you talked to Vincenzo Esposito, or are you, are you dropping the proper pronunciation when you said 
Esposito? Is that the um, pronounce? I've been known on the banter pod to just pronounce everything wrong. Um, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce his uh, name. Apparently, the, my man that I listen to, uh, it's not Sufjan Stevens. Am I pronouncing his name wrong? I've been bumping that bumping that illinois album a lot and and like i've been getting a lot of crap for just one of the i I always i always preface before the start of every banter pod just apologies for mispronouncing everything like i don't mean to do it um but yeah i think esposito like i think i i just kind of put my own little touch on that at at the moment uh thankfully it's um thankfully it's a written text so i i'll you know unless i do an audio book i'm never gonna have to fact check that no but shouts to vincenzo shouts to vincenzo it was, it was such a great chat and it's it's wild tracking down all these guys like john tabak was like hey i'm in split croatia right now wow. like when we're on a zoom he's like showing me the views in the back uh, Vincenzo, I don't have a story for because I think he did it out of his closet. But you know, I'm sure he was in a beautiful <laughs> villa in Italy. Um, and and even Damon, you know, Damon was really busy because he's on the coaching staff with the Boston Celtics. So we weren't able to chat really during all throughout last season. But he's been so gracious with his time and just connecting me with his family as well. And we've been doing basically weekly zooms the but the past couple months, just kind of going down memory lane um and it's been great like i'm really excited to share these stories with everybody we're going down memory lane right here this is great uh john tabak first assist in raptors history the weird (laughs) one the big center passing it out to alvin robertson vincenzo esposito i think was the first player signed for the raptors he was the first player signed they introduced him at the columbus club in little italy uh in in downtown toronto yeah and and then he lived in um i mean this is very toronto reference but you, you guys might get it but like he lived in oakville so yeah, he yeah. lived outside of wow, that's the a drive. city because he was told that the practice facility was going to be there and then when he bought he got the house and they were like oh never mind we're practicing at glendon college at york university so he was like he was like i guess my dogs like oakville so show <laughs> I uh, can't wait. Can't wait to read these stories. Uh, and there's oh, there, there. You can use this um, in the book. This is a photo. Yeah, in, in fact, that will be the cover now. Yeah, uh, you know, we have just made a cover reveal for a prehistoric. Yeah, if you're following along on YouTube, this is a photo I took in uh, the Dominican Republic, randomly in like 2008 or That's something. Amazing. I saw a Raptors jersey with That's... Esposito on the back. Esposito in number That's... four, and I thought. That's... That's him. Amazing. That's got to be him. No, it's not Vincenzo Esposito, but uh, yeah, oh my you can God, have that's it. Amazing. You can have it that free. That is so amazing. Prehistoric, we will be on the lookout for, but we wanted to get your opinion on some current topics uh, in and about the NBA right now. So we're going to play a game called the Up Down Report. Preparing your tubes. It's the Up Down Report. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We got thumbs. Get your thumbs up. Alex, we'll give you a topic. Uh, about the NBA or something kind of affiliated with the NBA. You tell us whether or not you like it up or down. After a two-decade hiatus, Hasbro is bringing back starting lineup action figures. They were big in the 80s and 90s, of course, but they've returned now with more detail, more (laughs) posability. They now cost $50. $50 for a starting lineup. So, Mm -hmm. Alex, you up or down on starting lineup action figures? Man, I was I was up until I heard the fifty dollar price point. Man, that's that's, that's a pricey. down for me. That's a down for me because one of the thrills about starting lineup figures, like I remember growing up, and I remember even when you when you go thrifting now, like uh, a lot of a lot of places will just if you go to a flea market, they'll just randomly have starting lineup figures just rolled out. And you know, I, I did have a run where I tried to collect every single like power forward from the nineties. <laughs> And so I have like a Tyrone Hill starting line of figure and it's just like ridiculous. But the crazy thing is my favorite thing about those figures is everybody looked like either Damon Stoudemire or Tyrone Hill. Um, they, they like, they like really only had like three like faces that they used for every single player. Um, to me, these seem a little bit too realistic for me, actually. Like I, it's not in the spirit of starting lineup figures and I am completely baffled by the $50 uh, price point. You're supposed to get these out to kids. Like yeah. these are for kids. That's that's like a that's like five starting lineups back that's in like the day. That's like popcorn. That's like a popcorn. No, I was gonna say that's like one and one point four popcorn. That's combo, too much. Man. Yeah, more. You said a lot of detail. More detail. More oh, yeah. posability and more junk. Did you see the the bottom half of these players? It's like they're wearing diapers. Uh, no, like a, a diaper like are, filled. These are too. These are too the realistic for me, man. I need these guys to look like NBA Live '96 players. 
like like this is like way too much detail actually yeah but yes i i am hung up on i'm actually hung up on the price point because i think these are great this is a great way to introduce kids and to help them find their favorite players and, and for 50 dollars, that's uh that's ridiculous that's so hefty. thumbs down that's hefty and man now that you mentioned uh the diaper Those diapers are hefty impossible not to notice also i kind of think it's weird that there's no nikola Jokic. There's like eight players that they're debuting this with. Uh, Jason Tatum, Trey Young, Ja Morant, Joel Embiid, Luka Doncic, Giannis, Curry, and LeBron. Not the two-time MVP? Disrespected. Well, All disrespected. the time, then. Wow. Underrated. Wow. Not even in the starting lineup for starting lineup action <laughs> figures. Staying in the realm of things you could play with, perhaps. Boardroom reported last week that Luka Doncic is revamping his TikTok with an AI-enabled virtual creator designed after his own likeness called Luke AI. Luke AI will completely control Luca's TikTok and will be co-developed with his fans worldwide. I mean, it looks like him. It does look like him. You can't uh, deny it. So Is that him? I mean, it looks exactly like him. <laughs> yes, that's that's the robot. That's yeah, the, I know. That's the I, AI. That's good. Up or down? on Luke AI or robot creators in general, Alex. Down, down. First of all, <laughs> that photo that photo looked like uh, Luca staring down Devin Booker the whole game seven <laughs> and, and they're beating him by 50. Um, you know, I heard TikTok, I heard AI, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, I just want to, I just want to, you know, go on Instagram, bring back Friendster, you know, as you know, bring back chat groups, message boards and things like that. Uh, the, the internet has officially evolved out of my age range, unfortunately. You're and, not hopping uh, on TikTok? No, nah, man. I know friends who've been on TikTok and now they have like millions of followers and like they're getting paid sponsorships off this. And I'm like, and all you're doing is just sharing your day to day life. I'm like, damn, I grew up in the wrong era, man. You know, <laughs> you know how hard all of us had to grind <laughs> to get to our positions? You, you, you tell me you just take your dog for a walk and you just share that, what latte you're drinking? at Starbucks, you know? I'm referencing my specific friend, actually, so I should shout it out. <laughs> <laughs> just in well, case she listens Twitter to where you gotta and, post a meme every day. To yeah, this is, uh, just in case she's listening and she's like, damn, man, he's ripping apart my life right now. Um, <laughs> just, just you, Sarah, mad respect. No, so thumbs down on this, man. What, it, what this, is like, this is like some metaverse stuff. It, I uh, can't, it I definitely can't. feels like the plot to Space Jam 3. Uh, Luca yeah. Dodgish's TikTok creator somehow takes over and uh, dominates via his phone. It's too bad, though. Uh, that you're not going to be hopping on TikTok because I was hoping we would get Will Lou Fitz, but the TikTok oh, version, like him. Everybody, go follow studio. Will Lou Fitz on Instagram. I'm mm -hmm. trying to get this man to 5,000 followers by the end of the season, and then when brands hit hit me up, I will be giving them my size because I run his account for him. <laughs> um, so everybody, follow Will. Lou Fitz. Are you like trying to target the track jacket brands or? All I want is a Uniqlo sponsorship, man. I've been begging for it's years, simple. and it's been radio silence. Did you wear a Uniqlo to the wedding? I, know, I heard that was a debate. When you about <laughs> yeah, yeah, I definitely did. But you know, I paired it with some Gucci loafers and you know a uh, Gucci tie, so a little, you know, a little, a little high low. A little high low. I don't like. I don't like dressing up in general, man. But you know, let's not get into that. I, mean, <laughs> I, I have many gripes about uh, just you know wedding etiquette. Mm. But you know, we, we can move on. You, you know, may not like dressing up, but you like putting a nice pair of shoes on your feet. So I wanted to ask you about these. Nike just unveiled the 20th edition mm. of LeBron's signature shoe, the mm -hmm. LeBron 20. Good name. Drops September 29th, and it's the first mainline LeBron. That's a low top. What do you think, Alex? Up or down on the Nike LeBron 20? Oh man, two thumbs up, two thumbs up to this one. You know, I haven't seen this shoe in person. You know, I've seen a lot of my influencer friends get get seated for this. So uh, once again, can someone at Nike please reach out to me? Um, but no, this is an amazing, uh, I love the shoe. You know, I think, you know, the some of the LeBron shoes look, look very, um, you know, just for LeBron. Uh, some of the models, especially, you know, if you wanna look at like the soldier models, this is a clean shoe. You know, for me, any basketball shoe that you can like wear casually, and feel like you can kind of just get a fit off on like a random Wednesday, just going out at sick. Like I, I would rock this pair, like, you know, endlessly. Once again, shouts, shouts to the swoosh, man. Hit me up. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm also trying to get the plug to come through with some LeBron 20s <laughs> because they look good, man. They don't they look, look like you got to be LeBron James to wear those and be styling out there uh, on the streets or on the court. Moving on, footage hit the internet last week, Alex, of Drake balling out 
in one of Chris Brickley's pickup games, dropping three-pointer after three-pointer after three-pointer. I think he made 11 in a minute-long clip and also hit a, a finger roll <laughs> at one point. Out of bounds. You think he was out of bounds? Yeah. <laughs> we've seen a lot of Drake pickup highlights. Ever since he put that court in his house, we've been seeing Drake pickup highlights. He seems to be improving, but uh, up or down on Drake's pickup game? I'm going to go down on this um, just because, as I tell people when they freak out, geek out over any NBA player who posts a clip in the offseason, like, I remember there was one summer when Andre Drummond apparently discovered a corner three <laughs> uh, and posted an edited video. These videos are edited, man. Like, uh, you know, he did make those 11 threes, but where's the 88 misses, man? I got to see, see the real tape. Is, is he still beefing with Pusha T? I know Pusha T can get his hands on that tape. Um, so, you know, shouts to Drake. He's living the dream. You know, got Cos Dawes all over his mansion. He's got a basketball court. Basically how I would live life if I had his... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, amount of generational wealth, but um, the pickup game, I don't know, man. I just can't take any like celeb, like pickup game footage seriously. So this is not directed towards Drake. Um, you know, shouts <laughs> to my OVO plug in case you're listening. I haven't slandered the brand, um, but no, that's just thumbs down, thumbs down to celeb pickup game footage. Yeah. It looks better though. He's, he's getting better. There's yeah. no doubt. Drake, <laughs> we've seen Drake I grow don't... from just a barely baller to hitting easy <laughs> shots uh, from, from outside. I can't believe how much I've seen Drake play basketball. Seriously. Uh, we saw, obviously, the missed three in the college game. Oh, yeah. Is yeah. the one. Oh, I think he God. missed that three, and he's like, never again. Yeah. Will that happen? No, he, he literally took it personally and built his own gym. <laughs> like, like that, that, that's the definition of, of, of taking it personally. But, yeah, shout, shout to Drake. Of course he can build his own gym. He's got bricks. <laughs> oh! oh! Damn. I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this question, but I heard it posed at a campfire this weekend. Alex, do you think Skeets could beat Drake in a basketball game one-on-one? -on -one? He's very oh confident. My... He thinks he's got it for oh sure. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? I would bet on Skeets. Yeah, I, I would, would bet on skeets. Like I, you know, like I, yeah, no, I would totally. You guys got to make that happen, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I know, I know. Um, I know Drake is a degenerate gambler, so you just gotta appeal to that and put some odds on it. You know, get get That's a, a good point. That betting sponsorship going. You know, put put like a point spread on skeets. Maybe like a skeets minus three and a half. Um, I know Skeets out here running half marathons, full marathons, super marathons. Like <laughs> all he's got to do is outlast Drake, man. You know, I, don't, I don't, you know, Drake's in, Drake's Drake's pretty ripped, but like you know, I I think I think Skeets got him at the stamina game and the quickness, man. Yeah, he's not. In, he ain't in marathon shape. Drake isn't. He doesn't want to see that Skeets defense. I don't think because uh, doesn't look like any lockdown defenders are out there. That was the conversation place. around the fire. I don't think we even need to talk about it. What I wanted to talk about was naming every one of the Ontario television channels from our youth. That's what we usually do around the campfire. You just you <laughs> named the new VR uh, recently, Alex. Wa growing up watching games, usually we go two through whatever fifty and name every. Every year when one of our Canadian friends come in, we just name every channel and we try and we try and knock them out. Channel forty seven, cable four, yeah, you know, all the channel forty seven. Oh, you guys, yeah, yeah. you guys, yeah, you guys right. memories are, are better than me. Yeah. But shows, shows, shows to YTV. YTV helped me. Down. Oh, the, the green goop. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Slime. Slime with Nicholas Piccolis. Oh, what? my God. <laughs> <laughs> what? Centropod. Yeah, this yeah, is, yeah, yeah. is CanCon right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm liking it. Um, but uh, speaking of pickup hoops, I came on your podcast recently, Running the Break. A couple weeks back, you asked me to compare my pickup game to a current player. Stayed humble and chose Nikola Jokic, the two-time reigning <laughs> MVP. So up or down on someone comparing their own pickup game to an MVP in the NBA. Is that good or bad? Uh, thumbs up. You know, I, I think a lot of us dream about playing in the in NBA, maybe even just a celeb game, maybe even just being called during a timeout to do one of those contests. So, like, anytime in your own environment, you know, you don't even need to be Nikola Jokic on every possession. If you were Jokic on one possession, like if you whipped, like, a cross-court pass, like, through, like, two defenders and it landed right in the shooting pocket of your teammate in the corner, you're Nikola Jokic. Like there was one night recently, a pickup ball when, you know, I locked down the best shooter on the other team, probably only for like four possessions, 
but I've been going around telling everyone that I'm Draymond Green. <laughs> um, and, and that's the story that I'm going to hold on to for like the next five years. So if you do one single thing that's comparable to an MVP or to a star player, you got to run with it. You got to run with it. Just don't, just don't tell me about it. You know, I, I don't really care about nobody's pickup game. Yeah. There we go. I think that's a great answer. As long as you can pull off one NBA-ish move, any comparison is valid. Uh, last topic I've got for you. We're more survivor heads down here, but I've heard you're dying to be on Big Brother Canada, so I know you're going up. But give me the pitch, up or down, on Big Brother Canada. Yeah, Big Brother Canada, um, you know, I'm probably going to blow my spot here. I've actually never watched the Canadian version. Uh, you know, I've <laughs> watched it, Big Brother US. So this actually sprung up because, uh, you know, again, you know, just it's been really cool getting to know the listeners of the Raptor show. And, you know, Will informed me that one of the producers of Big Brother Canada is a regular listener and a huge fan of the show. And I was like, okay, this is my in. Uh, before Will reminded me, no, like you also have to just be a civilian and submit an audition tape and go through the process. Uh, but, you know, I love watching Big Brother uh, US and, you know, I just think it would be a really fun experience. I've already crafted my fake story. I'm going to lie about my job, uh, lie about everybody. I'm going to say that Will Lou is my brother and, and he hosts a, a Raptor show. So then like, it's not suspicious that I know so much about the Raptors. Yeah. I'm going to say I run an Etsy store. Um, you know, definitely going to be no generational wealth references until I get to the final two. And then I'm going to call everybody broke when they vote me out nine zero. Um, but like, I, um, no, I just want to be on big brother. I think that's the reality show that I would uh, do the best in survivor is like an actual grind physically and mentally. I'm not down for that amazing race. Um, I would just call an Uber. Um, so like <laughs> n none of these other ones I'm, I'm willing to compete in, but like big brother, I think would be really fun. Just hang out in the house for a month. And yeah, and very, back I, to your I, I would be very upfront to people too. I'm like, hey, I'm gonna make you guys laugh, but I'm not doing no dishes. Um, <laughs> don't expect me to be able to cook, but however I can pick up the slack and you know in other places, um, I, I will do so. Yeah. The Draymond Green of the house. You might not be scoring the baskets, making the food, but you're doing everything else out there, <laughs> doing the dirty work. That's right. That's awesome. Uh, what else? Should we talk about eggnog? I know you want to get some eggnog talk in here. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I know you've been pushing eggnog on Will, and Will says, nah, that's disgusting. Yeah. However, this is something that I've been thinking about for a decade since we've been down here. I haven't found a good eggnog down here. But mm. but if you want to impress your colleagues at Sportsnet, you got to get a skid of Hewitt's Dairy Farm eggnog. Or you can, you can, literally, you can order it, but it's... It's I'm learning this down right now. Yeah, Hewitt's yeah. Dairy Farm. <laughs> so it's out in the wilderness there in Ontario. But they come to the city. They come to the big city and they deliver eggnog. And I'm not proud of this, but when Danielle and my wife had a, a milk and cookies bakery, we made she made everything. But she didn't make one thing she sold. She repackaged eggnog from Hewitt's Dairy Farm. We ordered it. It came in. We took it from the carton, poured it in the bottles, bottled it up, and sold the bottle straight up, which oh, it's, wow. it's, it's not right. It's not right to say that she made she made everything from scratch in there. But that eggnog, seasonally, we'd get it from Hewitt's Dairy Farm. I hate eggnog that comes in a carton. You get it in the in the grocery store. It's gross. What should it come in? Well, no, no. I just mean. Oh. <laughs> <It's> not... <laughs> okay, okay, it's not the container that the, no, no. that's the problem. Yeah, okay. well, I just I get this. Uh, I uh, like like Will on the show. I get this icky feeling th looking at that carton that's been sitting mm. sits in your fridge. You don't even open it, or you you pour a little bit out, and it's like ugh. There's eggs in that thing, and it's been sitting there for months and for years because it sits on the shelf for years. But that dairy farmer, they literally they make it. It's out the door. It's in your it's in your mouth in hours. So, or your bottle. Or your bottle. <laughs> uh, so, anyways, huge dairy farm. You'll get you, this is content for the show. Get Will drinking <laughs> it on the show. He'll love it. It's a long season. No, no, I'm so down with it. You know, every I don't know why every year towards like the end of November, like I'll just walk into Shoppers Drug Mart and just you know have an itch to pick up some eggnog. Mm -hmm. Like it's it just feels like the right move to do. Um, so I'm I'm very pro eggnog. You know, this is I'm guessing this is not part of the up down segment, but two thumbs up <laughs> eggnog. And um, you know, I'm always down for content. This is the thing I told Will. I'm like, you know our next phase of our career is just we're going to be youtubers who just like try ridiculous foods and different <laughs> things so like we'll dip everything in eggnog i don't care i'll do anything for a million views i'm getting old you, know? <laughs> you got it, exactly man. right we'll do anything for the views uh speaking of views where's the best place for people to watch you to hear you 
to follow you, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. Follow me on Twitter, uh, Steven underscore LeBron. Do I got to explain the name real quickly? Yeah, why not? That was on my list of things to ask. Yeah, first of all, people stop asking me this I, question. Oh, I hold say, on, I, can I make my guess? Yeah, yeah, do you? Steve yeah. Nash, LeBron James. I mean, you've had it for a long time. No, no, no. So, um, um, so here's what happened. So I used to work, I used to work, I used to be in accounting. Okay. I used to be a chartered accountant, real good boy. Parents were proud of me, even though I wasn't a doctor or a lawyer. Um, and, and, and that's when Twitter's kind of sprung up, you know, uh, 2008, 2009 era. And I was at my nine to five job. So when I signed up for Twitter, I actually didn't want, uh, my, my government name. Uh, to, to be on there because I planned on just tweeting about how miserable I was at my job. Um, and um, <laughs> yes. on the same day that I signed up, there was a USA Today headline that said Cleveland's LeBron suspended 50 games for steroids. And it was one of the most clickbait headlines ever. Uh, LeBron was still in his first stint in Cleveland. And when you click on it, it's actually a Cleveland Indians minor league pitcher named Steven LeBron. So I was like, <laughs> I was like okay. I was like, okay, let me claim this across all platforms. And, you know, I kept that name. So then HR couldn't, find, you know, I'll be tweeting about my, you know, I'll, I'll be tweeting. I'll be tweeting from like nine to five while getting my job done for anyone who works a nine to five office job. You know, you only put in two hours of real work every day. <laughs> um, that's how it works. But like, so I've kind of just kept that handle since, but yeah, Steven underscore LeBron, you can follow the Raptor show. We actually just recently got our own Twitter account. So it's the Raptor show on Twitter. And if people just want to look up the Raptor show, you know, I really appreciate you guys showing love to the off season content, uh, you know, uh, uh, Taz and Trey, but like, you know, season starting now, Will and I just did a media uh, day pod, uh, recap yesterday. We've got a lot of fun things, uh, coming up, you know, before we came on air, I just asked Trey and Taz to come on our show. So hopefully we'll, we'll make that happen to do a little NBA. Preview. Oh, now you ask this on the pod, putting it on the record too. That's right. You know, you know, you know, I'm a vet, right? This is how it works. <laughs> well, uh, you made, finding you, contract, you, a you, podcast. you actually made, will delete the first tweet from the raptors show twitter account you okay you're so here's you are cut so wow, micromanager <laughs> I, I okay here's what happened so so i'm i'm the social guy okay like will will you know you watch basketball do your x's and o's because i could care less um like you know i'm the social guy you know i give him the password and then you know his his head's blown up because like he's getting notifications of the Raptor show when we first started the account. Like we hit like I think like two thousand followers in like the first five minutes, and he was like you know this that that ego was getting bloated. And one and what uh, Will's like go to saying on the Raptor show is is hello and welcome. Yeah, uh, which has become like a thing that that fans latch onto. Mm -hmm. And a fan at him on Twitter and it was like, hey man, your first tweet's gotta be hello and welcome. And he's like, yeah, that's sick. Like he was just coming off, you know, Utah Watanabe, like ghosting him for ramen. So like he needed a pick me up. So he's like, let me get this engagement. So he just types in hello and welcome for no reason on a random Wednesday. Um, and then it just tweets it out. And like, it got a lot of engagement, but then I pulled it up and it says this tweet has been deleted. I'm like, what happened? He's like, yo, that was dumb, man. Like there was no context. I'm like, yeah, you're suspended two weeks from the account. So he's currently serving a two week suspension Cause we waited yesterday for me today until he took a photo with Chris Boucher. And then I tweeted it out with hello and welcome. And that was like a proper start to the account. Um, so, so Will is on suspension, um, for two weeks. Um, and you know, we might extend it further. It's going to be one of those situations where he's going to have a disciplinarian, uh, you know, hearing, uh, we're going to talk about it, but everybody follow the Raptor show. And if you want to follow us on, on Instagram as well, Will is at Will Fitz. Don't DM him because I run the account. Um, <laughs> and I'm at, I'm at Steve LeBron. Please juice my numbers so then brands can put me back on the seating list. Well done. Get those numbers up. Absolutely. <laughs> You're not going to have to hear from Will at all if you follow the Twitter account for the next two weeks. But after that, who knows? Who knows? You might be saying hello and welcome to everybody. Uh, Alex, thanks so much for taking the time, man. We're going to give away three copies, you said, of Cover Story. Yes, An incredible three copies. Book. Haven't told my publisher yet, but I know there's a bunch of boxes sitting in the warehouse, so we'll make it happen. However you guys want to do it, just send me the addresses of, of the three people and we'll get copies out to them. All right, let us know your favorite Slam Magazine cover down in the comments below. We'll pick them randomly, follow up with you with addresses, etc. Last question I got for you, the people wanted to know about your hat cover Coming in, you've got a 1992 World Series hat on there. Are we going to be getting um, a rematch of the 92 World Series? Braves versus oh, Jays. 
yo that could be possible and if that happens i will be uh i will be seeing you guys in person probably man for sure Incredible. That would, that would be phenomenal. We got the Murph dog coming on to talk baseball tomorrow, <laughs> as you guys call him. Blake the Murphy. Murph dog. That sounds like Big a very Murph mu- dog. Blake Murphy sounds very much a nickname like we would use because <laughs> Murph dog. <laughs> Murph dog. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got a Murph dog in my life as well. That's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. No buts. 10 a.m. Eastern. 10 a.m. Eastern. Channel. Live. The dog. Is this good later on? 1 p.m. Is that right, JD? That is that correct. Is correct. Yeah, see, the that people wanted a planning pod. They didn't think they wanted to hear, but they did. So, <laughs> 10 a.m., baseball. 1 p.m. Is this good? Opinions. Thursday, Survivor, no buffs. We won't talk about Big Brother Canada, no offense, but we will talk about Survivor America. That'll likely be 10 a.m. Eastern on the no buffs feed. Is that it? Well planned. Well Good planned, meeting. everyone. Alex, thank you again so much, Clipper Bros. You heard it here first. Have a great time. Turn up. Love you guys. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. And remember, all the brands out there listening, Alex Wong wears a uh, size nine shoe. Am I right? <laughs> How did you know that? <laughs> I listened to the pod. What, what's the, and since we're going around the horn here, what, what are you wearing? <laughs> 17 and a half. 17 and a half, yep. of course. Yep. Of course. XL, XL for tops, Huge. medium for shorts. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, people.